Father, we uh, ask your, your voice, your hand, your spirit strongly with us today. Open our ears that we might hear. Then Yeshua, we pray. Amen. This morning, <clears throat> uh, we have, and I might add, we have spared absolutely no expense in getting this special speaker here today. We are all honored, as well we should be. Ladies and gentlemen, did I say ladies and germs the other day? <laughs> I give you Mrs. Mary Davis. I was <clears throat> this morning having, uh, having a conversation with someone and it was neat because after that conversation, then I received a text message about read the utmost today. It was almost word for word, so much of our conversation that, that I was just uh, me texting. It wasn't Beatle. And so I wanted to read this, and then we have a thing to listen to by Elizabeth Elliot. It's not very long, but um, anyway, it just seemed like it, it, at least I know God is saying this to us. He's teaching us his ways. You know how Moses said, I want to know your ways. And God is showing us in our individual lives his ways. The habit of enjoying adversity, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body, 2 Corinthians 4.10. We have to develop godly habits to express what God's grace has done in us. It's not just a question of being saved from hell, but of being saved so that... The life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body, and it is adversity that makes us exhibit his life in our mortal flesh. Is my life exhibiting the essence of the sweetness of the Son of God, or just the basic irritation of myself that I would, that I would have apart from him? The only thing that will enable me to enjoy adversity is the acute sense of eagerness, the, of eagerness of allowing the life of the Son of God to evidence itself in me. No matter how difficult something may be, I must say, Lord, I am delighted to obey you in this. Instantly, the Son of God will move to the forefront of my life and will manifest in my body that which glorifies him. You must not debate. The moment you obey the light of God, his sun shines through you in that very adversity. But if you debate with God, you grieve his spirit. See Ephesians 4.30. You must keep yourself in the proper condition to allow the life of the Son of God to be manifested in you. And you cannot keep yourself fit if you give way to self-pity. Our circumstances are the means God uses to exhibit just how wonderfully perfect and extraordinary pure his son is. Discovering a new way of manifesting the Son of God should make our heart beat with renewed excitement. It is one thing to choose adversity and quite another to enter into adversity through the orchestrating of our circumstances by God's sovereignty. And if God puts you into adversity, he is adequately sufficient to supply all your need. Philippians 4.19 Keep your soul properly conditioned to manifest the life of the Son of God. Never live on your memories of past experiences, but let the Word of God always be living and active in you. And that just, to me, in a lot of ways, sums up a lot of what God's been doing um, around here and in our lives and speaking to us. And um, I liked the part that he brought out about self-pity because I think I can think of how many times I've encouraged people to be feeling sorry for themselves, and I grieve. We are to be encouraging one another to stand in the grace that God has supplied, not be the pig farmers with the prodigal, who supported him, but to be truly those that see the Son of God being manifested in us, that we receive the grace of God, 
his empowerment, and we encourage others to stand in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. And um, it says, Reprove, rebuke, exhort, for the time will come when men will not endure sound teaching, but will gather to themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, their own lusts. And that's the time we're in. And we need to be encouraging one another to stand up in who Christ has called us to be. Yes, we can we can um, empathize. Is it empathize? But we don't leave a person there. <laughs> poor you. Don't poor you, anybody. Listen to the Lord and his encouragement to cause them to stand. Put their hope in him. Often our, um, I think, self-pity we're, we gather to ourselves those who are going to go along with us and feel sorry for us. And that's poisoning. It's called not social media. Social media. That's called, that poisons me with demonic influence, but it poisons others. It, by many are defiled. And just, God, how can I encourage this person to stand? God says, my grace is sufficient for you in your time of need. So that's either true or it's not true. And I have to take God at his word. And I have to pray for that person to stand, but I can. I need to be an encouragement to them. Come on, stand up. We're in this together. It says, knowing that this affliction is happening throughout your world, throughout the world in your brothers. In other words, you're not alone because that's how the enemy uses it. Oh, poor you, you. You're suffering more than anybody's ever suffered. You're not alone. Scripture says that's how we resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that this is happening to everyone. So um, anyway, we're going to listen. Do you want to share something? You the only thing I want to say is that whatever Elizabeth Elliot said, well, I may not have called her about Oswald. I taught Elizabeth Elliot and everything. <laughs> maybe that's not so. Um, <clears throat> I, let me maybe go around on the flip side of this. And I bet Elizabeth Elliot would say this. Um, Miss Davis said, don't pour you anyone. Uh, do you need to empathize? Do you need to listen? Yeah. Um, but if you join them in their pity party, you are not only doing them no good, you're not doing the kingdom any good. The only person that you do anyone any good with the poor you is you. Why? Because that's why you're doing it. It's, it's to gain popularity. It's to gain likes on Facebook. It's uh, to get more pictures and thumbs up on instant gram um, all this it, it's all that they were there when when I needed them you know what <clears throat> no you weren't point one uh, that's not what they needed they don't need OUs oh poor thing poor poor thing um, it it gets them focused over on self and away from the kingdom where their life needs to be. Uh, Mrs. Davis and I, because of the position we hold in the body of Christ, and we don't like this, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, and we don't, we very much don't like it, we are often used to speak very hard words to people that other people won't speak. And we've watched it in churches. We knew a, a woman. We think that she um, was basically a, a witch. She uh, was constantly, I mean, in mass manipulating people, uh, tickling their ears. She, she was something else. Um, and uh, she always had wherever you would watch her going through the church building it's a pretty good sized church 
and there would be this group of women with her. Laughing and trying to be good here, talking. The uh, the thing they all had in common, except for her, but all all of the women, that they were all single. Not that they hadn't been married before, but they went to her for counsel, and somehow they all wound up divorced. This person would owe you, owe you, cry with them, and uh, this is the person that uh, told one of them that I know I don't have any evidence for this, but I think your husband is sexually molesting your teenage daughter. Zero evidence of it. The husband was looking into Christianity and becoming to church. He never came through the door again. OUs are about yous, okay? And is it the Bronx they talk like that? Yeah. All right. Yeah, anyway, the folks, it's supposed to be about the kingdom of heaven. You, you, if you're in, in scripture, that's what it's, it's about. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. A good tree can only produce good fruit. So it makes the tree good. Elizabeth Elliot says, I believe there is such a thing as self-esteem and self-image, but I do not think that it is something that you and I ought to be paying much attention to. Life is too short for that as far as I'm concerned. I would much rather use the energy and the time that I have and direct it towards knowing God, worshiping God, loving God, and daily praying that He will make me much more like Himself. Welcome to Gateway to Joy. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliott, talking today with my daughter, Valerie Shepard, from California. Such a pleasure when the two of us can get together. It's kind of rare. And Val has many things to say that I need to hear. And today, Val, you're going to be talking about what? Self-pity. Self-pity. Self-pity is satanic, I believe. Yes. Mm -hmm. So tell us what you have to say. First of all, if we are children of God, we know that we have a heavenly Father who is infinitely wiser than we are and loves us so much that he knows exactly what we need for our growth in grace, for our sanctification. And he knows what trials can be used and will be used for our good and for His glory. So I think I want to challenge people to, first of all, believe the truth that they are children of God. If they are Christians, they are children of God, and their Heavenly Father gives to them and allows for them whatever is right and will bring glory to Him. So if we have a hard situation that we are in, not to be full of self-pity, not to be thinking, my situation is unique, nobody has ever had this kind of trouble before, and so I must do something about it, but rather to think in terms of, thank you, Lord, that you have entrusted this trial to me because you wanted to test my faith and you wanted to see if I could be thankful, obedient, and a trusting child. It reminds me of that beautiful hymn that many of our listeners know, I trust. Uh, when peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows, like sea billows, roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Yes, there are times of peace and times of sorrow, in either case, we are to accept what God has given us without complaining mm -hmm. about our lot. Mm -hmm. And 
in this day and age, we are told by the world that we need to dwell on our past, we need to dig it up, and we need to deal with it. Well, Paul says, forgetting what lies behind, I press on for the prize of the mark of the high calling of Christ. And it is wrong to dwell on something that happened to us in the past. We may need to deal with it in simply giving it up, giving it to the cross, giving it to Christ and saying, thank you, Lord, that I am your child and you have forgiven me and you've, you can forgive the person that did something wrong to me but I'm not going to dwell on how to get even or how this thing should affect my life every day. I think there's too much that we hear that because we're victims of something that happened to us in the past, then therefore we are inadequate to serve or we're uh, incomplete in some way. And we are complete in the Lord. The Lord, when he saves us, makes us whole again. And he wants to give us, he makes us a new creation. We are new creatures, and therefore the old has passed away. I think there's a, a very subtle lure that comes from our enemy, the devil, to make us feel that we're in a special category and that we are very complicated people. We're mm -hmm. really very deep and complicated. Mm -hmm. the and so we've got to spend weeks, months, perhaps years, uh, working through whatever this problem was that we think we had in the past. And I don't find that anywhere in the scriptures. And of course, psychology and psychiatry are very new in, in this century, really. There never was such a thing mm -hmm. until a hundred years ago or so. And I just wonder what Christians were doing before they were told that they needed to work through things and dredge up all sorts of memories that perhaps were not even real memories, but imagined. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't agree with you more. And I that, think um, we need to memorize and know this verse in our hearts from 1 Corinthians ten thirteen: No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. I hadn't thought of that. I was glad that you quoted the other words about forgetting those things which are behind. How, how can we do that? By choosing to do it, by just leaving it at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. That is where Jesus dealt with all the sin of the world as... Uh, F.W.H. Myers puts it in his wonderful poem called St. Paul, desperate tides of a whole world's anguish forced through the channels of a single heart. And my sorrows and my trials and your sorrows and the sins and everything else were a part of that desperate tide, but it went through his heart and does just what you're telling us, redeems us, delivers us, saves us. Mm -hmm. I know in my own life when I have started to feel sorry for myself because of my sin, because I think I'm never going to get over or past a particular weakness in my character, my husband reminds me that I am a child of God and that he's even allowing me to see my weakness so that his power may rest upon me, so that I may be totally dependent upon what Christ can do through me, instead of thinking that I have got to get this together in my own flesh, I've got to get this straight. And when I've seen myself do the same thing over and over again, it could be yelling at the children. When I've made, over and over again, I've made a resolve that I will not yell anymore. <laughs> And I find my, my anger rise, and I find myself frustrated, and my voice begins to rise. And at the same moment that I'm starting to raise my voice, there's an inner, still, small voice that reminds me that that is not the way to speak to my children. 
And so I'll get discouraged. I'll be full of self-pity that I have done this again. Um, and I will cry and my husband will say, you're forgetting that you're a child of God that he promises to pour his grace through and he promises to help you. So go back to him again, confess it again, go back and say, I need you to control me. I need you to help me with my thoughts and help me to be motivated by love rather than motivated by my own set of rules that if they are being broken, I think the world has come to an end. There is no way that these children are going to learn to grow up in the Lord, to serve Him, to glorify Him if they can't get this one little thing straight. For example, they're not to play after breakfast. They are excused from the table and they are to go get their teeth brushed and come back to me and say, is there anything that I can do for you, Mama, before we start school? 8.30 is our time when we have family devotional time when I lead it because Walt is gone. And be, so between 8 and 8.30, they are supposed to be available to me. Or if I tell them to, they're supposed to be playing with Theo and Sarah. And over and over and over again, they forget that they are supposed to come do this. And so I'm just giving an example of how my frustration rises because I'm motivated by my schedule, my rules, and I'm forgetting the love of Christ. I'm forgetting that they will learn eventually, and they are still children, and the love of Christ will eventually help them to be uh, reminded of what they are supposed to do. And of course, we should remember how patient the Lord is with us. With us, right. We are His children, and He's merciful and patient and gracious, and He is helping us. And you are helping your children daily, one day at a time, to understand these rules and to live an ordered life. Mm -hmm. And God is not the author of confusion, but mm -hmm. it is line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, as the Word of God says. I think we as mothers have to accept the fact that that's part of mothering, is to repeat. And if we're motivated by Christ's love, then there's no end to the number of times we can repeat but with gentleness and with a loving spirit. Of course, because of our sin, we get out of control and and we're not motivated by, by His love. We're motivated by this desire to be in control ourselves, our own flesh wanting to be in control. And that's what brings self-pity so often is that we, we can't do it by ourselves. The Lord tells us in Jeremiah, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. If we think of him as a hard master and ourselves as hopeless cases, let's remember those words, that his thoughts toward us are thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end, and how marvelously patient and kind he is in teaching us the lessons that we need to learn. Thank you, Val, for being with me today. The subject of self-pity, it's a warning to all of us. I don't suppose there's any one of us that's not tempted over and over again to feel very sorry for ourselves. Somebody hurt me, somebody said something nasty, somebody didn't thank me, whatever. Give it to God. <clears throat> One thing that I would say, though, in uh, when you're dealing with people, maybe it's yourself, but, um, you know, they brought up, we're well, not alone. Now, I, I want you to hear what I'm saying. You're not alone. You're not the only person that's ever had this happen, et cetera, et cetera. You try that when you're counseling somebody. And you'll find somebody probably stomping out on you, and they don't care. Uh, the reason is, is because uh, you can hear about 
uh, somebody that you know that's in the middle of a heart attack and they're having this terrible stuff going on with them. I mean, it's really bad. <clears throat> and uh, you, uh, okay, I'll stop and pray for them. But their heart attack holds absolutely nothing to your cold. I mean, your cold is so much worse than their heart attack. The reason is because we look at things on a relative fashion. Is it happening to me? Well, you know, you don't need to be feeling self... Yeah. Those things are, are true, and I agree with, with what is being said. Um, but, you know, unless the Lord is telling you really bust them in the head, um, that, that's, that's not one that's going to necessarily... Uh, uh, and, and it's 100% correct, don't get me wrong, but people really, they look at, but it's me. Well, that's the issue. And maybe you can use it to get up that, you know, when they start to, do you hear yourself? Um, and again, part of the thing I think that a lot of counselors, because the, the goal in counseling often is to bring relief to the person, that should not be the goal in counseling for a believer. The believer should be it's about the kingdom. And so, perhaps you need to say, other people have had this too, and they, they've relied upon Christ. person gets mad that's okay, but what you've done, remember the kingdom of heaven? You plant a seed, and the crop comes up later. It's not about relieving the person of their stress and owies, and uh, I need a, a Band-Aid on my bobo. Um, it's, it's about getting them to the kingdom of heaven.